And um, so a bit of fuck up, up really. I mean, where were you brought up and born, and how did you end up here, or are you born and bred, or what? I was born in Hokitika. You were born in Hokitika. And in the gold rushes, a great great grandmother and four great grandparents arrived in Hokitika okay. between 1865 and 1867. Right. So Hokitika is my Tūranga Waiwai. Yeah. And, um, the uh, great grandparent whose surname I have, he was a ship's captain who um, left uh, an immigrant ship in Dunedin and found his way to Hokitika because they were short of ship's crews and mm. was very much involved in unloading the big ships out at sea, the, the ones on the Trans Tasman mm. mm. trade couldn't get in the river, mm. so they were unloaded by um, mm. freight by small sailing ships and their passengers mm. by steam tugs. Okay. So, and his wife, um, she came out as an immigrant from England, first immigrant ship to Timaru, and she's about 11, I think, was about 15 when she got mm. to Hakataka with her family, mm. Mm. and went on to have 17 children in Hakataka, okay. of whom eight of them survived beyond the age of two. Okay. And then I had an American great grandfather as well, um, uh, Charles Pearson. He was a he was a mystery man, mm. but he had cordial factories following the gold from Queenstown mm. to mm. Canary to Stafford to Greenstone mm. to Kamara, mm. and that was my father's mother's father, and. She and her siblings believed that her mother uh, came out from England as well, and she was a with family. Um, where she's with aunt and uncle, and they lived at um, Piper's Flat near Stafford. Mm -hmm. um, so they met, met up and married. So I've got that whole mm -hmm. Hokitika, mm -hmm. um, um Kumara area history. Um, Going back to the gold rushes, uh, some of them gold miners, but others of them merchants and mm, mm. Um, sailors. And okay. my mother um, came from Melbourne. Her parents were very, very poor people from the cotton mills of England, mm, mm. Um, and she came to work at Seaview Hospital in the 1930s. So I was educated at Hokitika District High School, which was my primary education, and Western High School, my mm -hmm. secondary. Mm -hmm. So that was on the same site for 13 years, it's just the school changed its status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. And so you, what did you do when you left school? Um, I um, received a State Services Study Award to study um, economics, mm -hmm. um, but I, I was meant to be a BCom, but it turned mm. out to be a BA because I wanted to do geography as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I actually got this award is I could actually name a government department that I would like to work mm. for, and actually mm. the division um, in it. Which is the Town and Country Planning Division of the uh, Ministry of Works. Right. And this was the influential book, The National Resources Survey of the West Coast, which was produced in 1959. By the Ministry of Works. By the Ministry of Works. And so there was a whole flurry of activity in the, um, the term of the um, Second Labour Government to promote regional development. And these these were done uh, through much of the country. The first one was the West Coast. 1959. Yeah, and reading that in the school library. Okay. <laughs> I thought, well, uh, this whole concept of regional development, and particularly applied to here, um, interests me. It's something I wanted to, wanted to do. 
So I had my um, time counted on the public service from the day I enrolled at university. And um, I, I had a permanent job in the uh, school holidays. Which is, um, it's pretty amazing, eh? Yeah, which is, um, <laughs> the first time was in head office in Wellington. Mm -hmm. um, the second time um, it was in the office of the Commissioner of the West Coast. And that yeah. office arose from the Inangahua earthquake in 1969 and the closure of the Dobson and Dauntless coal mines. Um, and it was set up to be a conduit between the West Coast and government to look at a redevelopment package for the West Coast. And it had a minister, Duncan McIntyre was the minister, and it had a cabinet committee. And the um, commissioner was an ex-district commissioner of works mm -hmm. from Christchurch, which is how I managed to get seconded to his office. He wanted, mm -hmm. wanted somebody to an additional person there. And it turned out that um, he, he did actually have a office manager in Greymouth, employed by the mm -hmm. Internal Affairs Department, but he didn't actually want somebody from the Ministry of Works in his office. Mm -hmm. So I managed to um, uh, be an office in the government buildings mm -hmm. and Hokitika from the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. so. so what's what, what's regional development? Regional economic development, can you give us a I think it definition? Comes, it comes from um, the realisation that different parts of countries developed at different paces. Okay. So, um, some of them develop too fast and they can cope with, such as mm -hmm. Auckland, mm -hmm. and others that have had uh, better times decline. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to seek some form of balance. Okay. The West Coast has been through that growth and decline thing many, many times. And the, the government has actually intervened quite a number of times. Mm. Um, largely because the West Coast, up until the 1980s, were a crown colony. And that's how it was described by the Buller County Council. A crown colony. A crown colony. And that the crown owned something like 96% of the land. It owned the port of Westport, it funded the port of Greymouth and dictated what happened, owned the railways, provided the backbone of the mm. transport system, owned most of the mines, mm. was the agent of um, developing new farming, it was the uh, manager of the forests, both for production and protection. Mm. So um, the local authorities had very little Mm. power, and so did private enterprise, and to some extent. Um, and the Town and Country Planning Division got, in, got mm. very much involved because the Town and Country Planning Act required every local authority to have a district planning scheme. Yes, yes. That was from 1926, okay. and the West Coast still didn't have them by the late 1950s. And, mm. Um, the Buller County Council mm. said, so, well, how can we do this because we're a crown colony? We have no influence whatsoever. Um, but anyway, um, the, fir the first intervention was actually after the uh, decline in coal set in after mm. the 1950s. Mm. Um, and that was because of diesel and, and, and hydro schemes? And the uh, the dieselisation of the railways and, alternative and uh, energy, uh, yeah. electricity and mm. possibly the um, 1951 industrial um, mm -hmm. lockout, or, lockout. Or, or strike, depending on which side you're on. Well, uh, it was definitely a lockout. Lockout, yes. <laughs> right. and, um, it seems that there's been a cycle of this happening where governments have felt a responsibility for the West Coast or mm. a, a, a guilty conscience 
I'm not quite sure which one at which time. But, um, mm -hmm. but there is this continual closing of coal mines. So there was a commission of inquiry mm -hmm. set up in, I think it was 1957-58, it's this one here, okay. in the port on the west coast, which yes. analysed um, what was the sort of industrial future of the west coast. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get these later. Yep. That's, that'd be better. Um, so, out of that, the um, development of state farming was accelerated. Um, particularly with big schemes like um, mm -hmm. um, Cape Fowl and, and um, some of the ones around Hokitika and then out Bell Hill Way. Mm -hmm. um, and the Forest Service through that was charged by the government of changing the, um, the way the indigenous forests were managed mm -hmm. to put them on a more sustainable basis. and. One of, one of the problems was there was not much investment in the industry because they had very short term licences to log the forests. So they went to a system of long, long term licences mm -hmm. in exchange for um, investment in higher levels of processing. So that's where we see Stillwater and Nahiri and Ruatup and Harry and Watarawa and Reefton. There was quite an expansion. So this was still processing natives. Yes. They need a remu. Uh, remu with the beach sitting there as a potential. Okay. And exotics being uh, planted to take the place mm -hmm. of the level of cut that remu supplied. Okay. So that that was a major outcome of that that the Forest okay. Service um, was initiating, and with the beach. It was seen as quite different from the Rebu, that the Rebu, well, the Potocarps were mm. sort of like a 300 year growth cycle. The beach were about an 80 year mm. growth mm. cycle. Mm. And it could be seen that they could be managed. Mm. But um, there was a lot of very low quality wood, mm. um, yeah. which were, the solution to that was to have some sort of pulp mill. And the problem of that is it needed vast quantities. So, okay. Um, this is a still water scheme. Uh, well, still water was a potential site, yes, mm, but yeah. not the only site. Mm. Um, so they, during the 60s, the Forest Service developed the west coast and south London beach schemes, mm. and that's when mm. uh, that coincided with the rise of our national interest in protecting the environment. Mm. It was a socialist economy. Um, mm. It's hard to say whether it hampered it or hindered it. Mm. Um, but in some, in some respects, the state and industry worked mm. together. Um, and you could think of, think of the um, the mining industry, coal mining, mm. um, largely private investment from often overseas. Initially. Initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and but the state providing mm. the infrastructure mm. and well, the um, ports of Greymouth and Westport um, were under well, they were initially state developed before mm. 1884 and they began under harbour boards, but the harbour boards never really had mm. full jurisdiction. Okay. So, because the, the government approved everything they did, mm. and um, Westport went bankrupt, so it became a, mm. the government's only government run port. Greymouth uh, mm. almost went bankrupt, but it was continually propped up, mm. but also suppressed. It wasn't allowed to um, charge um, market rates for use of the port in order to keep the coal price of the North Island there. Okay. So the government had its control over it that way. But mm -hmm. it said it was uneconomic, but it would 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this, yeah, this is interesting. So, and, and does the the development never quite took off, really, because it, it hasn't really, has it? I mean, it's been it's been it's been in, 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 in waves. But but you know, there's still thirty thousand people in a sort of well, the population region. is the same as the peak as the peak at the gold rush. Yeah, yeah. It got to about thirty six thousand. So it's never, never really grown, has it? I mean, it's, no. it's, it's and, and that's where it gets into its other bind. Um, it needs population to maintain its services, and it needs mm. the services here because it's remote. And then you get into the the population-based funding of health services that mm. was introduced in the 1970s. Mm. Um, so, because it population was declining, yeah. the health service would yeah. be reduced in its funding. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so, so it's never sort of grown because of it's just so overly based on on resource extraction. Would that be the truth? You think? Probably because, um, because it's relatively remote. The remoteness. And, um, it, it is based on mm. um, local resources. Mm. Um, mm. Many of them, which are quite bulky, so they need expensive transport systems. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, Hokitika survived after the gold rush mm. because it had been the provincial capital and it retained Take the government services, services yes. that, that administered land, mm. and it had. Um, Lots of things that provincial capitals had, mm. like a lunatic asylum that became a psychiatric hospital. Mm. So you mm. had it, its two mm. biggest industries were health and the public service. Just right like Greymouth now, Greymouth has sort of taken over that. But yeah, and Greymouth has taken taken that over. Mm. Mm. Um, Hokitika ha ha had the well, it did have the full range of public mm. services mm. from mm. the provincial days including mm. education and, mm. and then it became more focused on the land based administration mm -hmm. um, and Greymouth picked up the mm. social services, people based administration and Westport was uh, still in Nelson. So, 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 yeah, I mean, this is interesting because it, it, it's like a little bit of the old Eastern Europe in a curious way, isn't it? I mean, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's, it's that whole government, as you said, the, the, the state ownership and control of things. Yeah. So, so, so go, go back to your story, so yes. that you got this scholarship and then you got your degree and then what? Well, I worked in... Um Head office of the Ministry of Works, and it was largely. It's in Wellington. In Wellington, mm -hmm. uh, it's largely on um, resource and regional development projects. Mm -hmm. Most of my colleagues were working on the administration of district planning schemes, which actually mm -hmm. I found totally boring. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So. And there was one part of it that produced these resources surveys. It was actually sort of a research section, yes. um, full of geographers and historians mm. and whatever. Mm. Mm. In this mm. great monolith of a 12,000 people engineering business, really. Yes. Um, but what I appreciated was actually working alongside engineers and architects. Mm. Mm. Um, because I t tended to get attached, for example, to the, the power division, which was the, yeah. the builders of the power stations, so yeah. the investigations of them on behalf of mm. the electricity department. Mm. And um, the Clutha scheme was actually the first one that really affected people. Mm. Mm. And it was the first one that had a mm. impact Report on how how the landscape, the geography, the economy, mm. the people, mm. The, mm. everything but the Maori were, affected, were um, <laughs> yeah. uh, impacted on, and I was seconded to that. Okay. Um, uh, 
um, interdepartmental committee yeah. to compile that report. And at a later stage, on the east coast of the North Island, Te Tarawhiti, it was going through a process of dealing with depopulation and yes. soil erosion. Yep. And the solution there was seen to be a, a planting of planting of forests. Mm, mm, mm. So we were planning ahead with when they would be utilised on the, mm. this would be the 1970s and the 1990s. Mm, mm, but, mm. Um, so again, the Ministry of Works was leading an interdepartmental committee and there was a liaison officer in Gisborne mm. and I was the liaison officer in Wellington, mm. not the two parts, mm. uh, talking to each other. Mm. Um, and somewhere along the line, um, this was when the government started to get a realisation that the environment was important. Mm -hmm. So it didn't create a ministry, it appointed a minister. And mm -hmm. he had an officials committee of 14 heads of government departments. Mm -hmm. um, and a cabinet committee. Mm -hmm. So. For some reason or other, I was seconded to be the secretary of that committee. So that was in the very early stages of stages of environmental impact reports and mm. Um, mm. concluding whatever happened with um, mm. Manapuri and st starting the friends of was it the friends no sorry the guardians of Lake Wanaka. Yes. And. It then moved on to the uh, South Island beach forests okay. and we got seconded to some working party on that as well, looking at the social and economic pros and cons. And so th this is when? The seven, late this would be in the late 70s. Late 70s. Is this before the Maruia report or mm. the Maruia? Yep. Yeah. Um, mm. And this um, late seventies, there were two very important pieces of legislation, but all our reforms really: mm. the Local Government Act, mm. nineteen seventy four, and the Town and Country Planning Act of nineteen seventy seven. The Local Government Act set up a system of regional government. That was compulsory in Wellington, Auckland, and Christchurch, yeah. and voluntary elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then it actually moved to being compulsory elsewhere, mm -hmm. except the elsewhere um, didn't have fully elected regional councils, but they, um, the constituent. Um, boroughs and counties appointed members oh, okay. to, yeah, to yeah, a yeah. united council. Mm, mm, so mm. the West Coast United Council was formed in 1976. Mm -hmm. um, and picking up on the um, uh, Town & Planning Act, it came up with a system of regional planning which was not just land use planning or resource mm. planning, it was everything that the public sector did planning. Mm. Mm. And it had a provision in it that a regional or regional or United Council would prepare a draft regional planning scheme that would go through a process of being approved by the government. Mm -hmm. And once it was well, it was um, went through the uh, departmental system, and w then went to the executive council and would be approved by the governor general mm -hmm. as an order of council. And the act said that an approved regional planning scheme shall be adhered to by every by the crown and every public and local authority. So it was mm -hmm. binding, but. How do you produce one for the West Coast, except in very general terms, which was done? So just to backtrack a wee bit, mm. 
is when the United Council was set up, the Minister of Local Government, Alan Hyatt, mm -hmm. came down and had a big ceremony in Greymouth about it. And he told the assembled local government politicians that you will be the planners, you will be making the decisions for evermore mm -hmm. through this process. Yes, yeah. And that interested them compared with Buller County saying we're a county colony, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. We were going to do this in partnership with the government mm -hmm. and it was going to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. And there was a compulsory regional planning committee which had a Crown representative on it. Um, and the people appointed from the boroughs and the counties um, took very seriously the oath that they were to consider the, the prime consideration was the good of the whole region, not of the individual appointing authorities mm -hmm. and they all did that apart from one he was the mayor of Greymouth, yeah. Harry Dallas okay. Okay. in fact there were 14, 14 councillors mm -hmm. got paid mm -hmm. got paid the nine dollars a day for the meeting fee mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so they asked for assistance so I was actually sent to the Christchurch Ministry Works Office yeah. um, to provide them some planning support and the, um, they also didn't have their own administrations. One of the local authorities mm. became the administering body, yeah. which was Grey County, yes. which was specifically chosen so mm. the Grey North Borough wasn't it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so by 1979 they wanted me shifted over here, so I did. That's when I came, That's when you came, back, here. came back, so I've been here ever since. And you you worked for the Ministry of Works up until over here. 1986, yes. when the United Council decided to have its own administration, okay. and what the chief executive was called was a principal officer. So I became a principal officer okay. from 1986 to 1989, right. when there was another reform with the Resource Management Act and the Local Government Act that set up the regional councils, which we have at the moment. Right which potentially could have been across the board but in my opinion it were captured by the Ministry for the Environment and reduced back to being just natural resource regulators. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, some, some of them have actually taken the wider one of it. Um, not so much here. Mm, mm. So but so I was with the um, Regional Council to 1994 and we did actually carry on an economic and social development role. So you were like... I was Deputy General Manager and... Of, of the Regional Council. And um, yeah. Manager of Policy or something. Mm, mm, um, mm. But, um, one of the things we actually did was when the Gladstone plywood mm, factory was mm, mm. being sold off by us, the South Australian government, mm. um, it was going to be shipped to Malaysia or something and mm. um, Doug Truman, who was a councillor at the time, mm. said to me, we can't let this happen. Mm. Ring up the South Australian government and ask them if we can do a deal, which we did and they, they, they said, yes, we'll provide you with the books. And, all the information. We called together a meeting of the of the staff, the um, suppliers and the customers of the plywood factory. We got a um, business analysis of it done and set it up and it became a company mm -hmm. and has survived. Yeah. The um, unfortunate thing about it is that most of the money came from my ten franchise fr franchise holders from the North Island who had the majority of the shareholding, uh, like three quarters of it. Okay. Um, but it, there's about a quarter West Coast shareholding in it. And it paid extremely good dividends for its first, mm, mm. first how many years? 20? 
Mm. So, so, so what, what, I mean, what was your personal feeling about this whole, you know, the whole native logging issue and, and, and what happened in, in Timberland? Well, and I, was, I was personally, mm. like I think most of the United Councils, mm. was wanting to get a balance mm. between maintaining the well, one of the policies of the Regional Planning Scheme was community viability, was maintaining community mm. viability mm. Mm. while being long-term sustainable mm. um, and doing uh, sort of optimising or maximising or whatever the uh, environmental values as well. So there's yes. a lot of conflict in that. But yeah. it was trying to find a balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the United Council, the boroughs and the counties, the Tormals Association and the Timber Workers Union mm. seem to have found a balance, mm. but it was still not what the environmental groups wanted. Mm. Mm. So what happened is the government appointed the newly appointed Secretary for the Environment, uh, Roger Blakely. Mm. He was a yeah had a doctorate in concrete mm. uh, engineering <laughs> to actually mm. mediate all of this. Mm. Mm. Um, and he was meant to be the Crown facilitator, I was meant to be the United Council facilitator, mm. Mm. which I was up until the end when he said I was actually the like, United Council's representative. Oh, okay. uh, no, I wasn't. Because mm. um, we had this statutory process to go mm. through. Mm. Mm. Um, but then what happened, there's a document that was produced that the United Council had not fully seen it, that they'd, mm. there was a meeting was demanded to take place on November the 6th, 1986, which lasted from mm. 10 o'clock in the morning to about mm. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm which um, council was still trying to seek this balance. Kerry Burke is mm -hmm. the representative of the government, I think, rather than the member of parliament for the West Coast, mm -hmm. um, was actually saying, well, if you don't sign this document the way it is, um, there will be no jobs for the West Coast of the Forestry Corporation when it's announced tomorrow. So they had this threat hanging mm, over them. Mm, mm. Also the knowledge that they were bound by their own regional planning scheme to go through those processes. Mm. And that they had no opportunity for legal opinion. Mm. But they, they voted, probably not unanimously, I'm sure Jim well, I think Jim Regan didn't vote for it, um, to actually go forward with it, subject to mm. getting a legal opinion. And, uh, this is the, go forward with the accord. But then, but then the whole thing, we were meant to get that before Roger Blakely threw out on the plane out of Grain out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. Mm. So between about 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock, we were meant to get all that done. And I got hold of the office solicitor of the Ministry of Works, mm. who administered the Act. And he said not to, not to sign it, he'd be acting contrary to the Act. Mm -hmm. But the Chairman of the United Council, Ethel McGee, mm -hmm. he was extremely unwell. He was probably dying at the time. Mm -hmm. And Jim O'Regan was the Deputy Chair and they were in my office wondering what to do. Jim was really there to support um, Ethel. And Roger Blakely was there in continuous consultation with the Minister for the Environment's office because he was mm. had to get this thing signed before he left. And he was on his knees on an office mm. next door to us with the telephone cord extended right round so that he could actually listen to our discussion with the office solicitor at Wellington, mm. the Ministry of Works. Um, he denied that he ever did that, but he did. It was just all of this pressure. Mm -hmm. And 
Some of those councillors left that meeting in tears. So it was classic bullying, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I remember Anna van der Geest. Mm. She left in tears. Mm. Um, so, to me, that was actually, the whole thing was actually devastating, mm. personally, because I had a responsibility for the process working. Mm. And I thought I'd failed it. Mm. Um, the next morning, uh, there were no jobs for the, Hoka, or the West Coast Forest Service of the Forestry Corporation got for it. Came out. Um, the um, United, or Jim O'Regan, I think he may have got um, a reason through to repudiate the agreement, but he didn't put a date on it for when it was to be done. So after mm -hmm. a couple of weeks of wondering what on earth to do, mm -hmm. um, in the, in the meantime, there was a movement that had grown up, in the, um, particularly in Hokitika, but in the forestry settlements of the West Coast, called West Coast Forestry Families. Mm. was sort of ready to support um, the, the forestry families. And then, it's one thing that happened in that, that the Anglican Bishop of Christchurch came over and mm. called a meeting amongst the churches mm. around Hokitika. Mm. And during that meeting that I was at, there was a solution that appeared. Well, not necessarily a solution, but a way forward. That we would actually approach the Prime Minister to, um, to the government to work with the West Coast to actually sort out the detail of the way forward on this, because the whole thing was just far too rushed. This is Longy. It was David Longy. He, he actually transferred it to the Local Government Commission. Um, not quite sure why, but they and, uh, encouraged the mm. United Council to come up with a new form of um, regional government that might have some of these resources that, that transferred to mm. it. Um, and the state aid enterprises. But then mm. um, his government changed and it became a national government and mm. a war on... The whole Timberland thing started to happen. Well, Timberland's New Zealand, New Zealand Forestry Corporation really didn't want the West Coast. Okay. So the, the government set up Timberland's West Coast, which is t just another state-owned enterprise. Mm -hmm. But the, the national minister of local government, um, he he didn't like this whole regional planning thing and, uh, mm. and the crown being down and mm. passed legislation to get rid of all that. Okay. Um, which is a, a real pity because it would have been a constitutional reform. Mm. It's just, it was only, it was only um, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and the West Coast actually took it seriously. Mm. Mm. So that was somewhat Personally devastating as it was, it was to a lot of, a lot of people. Mm. Um, then, in 1988, we had the two Greymouth floods. So, yeah. so, in the first one, or oh, well, just going back a bit, mm. the United Council had a regional coordinating role. Mm. But the actual operational role was with the Dulles and counties. Mm. Mm. So the United Council didn't really step in unless it was asked. Mm -hmm. But it was a lick to um, Wellington. So it didn't really have a role in the first one. But then the government not realising um, that the West Coast was not a pin on a map gave its government support money to the Greymouth Borough Council to, mm. for the whole of the flooded mm. area. Mm -hmm. And it spent it only in Greymouth. So mm. next time around, mm. 
uh, it wouldn't be that. Gave it to the United Council. Yeah. And I became the Disaster Recovery Coordinator. But because the United Council was actually very weak, mm. administratively, they only had two or three full-time staff and three mm. part-time staff mm. or something mm. like that. Mm. Just think all that for now. Mm. Um, mm. And it had recently been under attack by uh, Graham Alpara over having put the administration charge up. Mm. Barry Dallas took it to court. Mm -hmm. So it needed somebody who could actually mm. be, uh, it was either divorced politically from it or could act very strongly. Mm. Mm. So we arranged with the, um, the, the what's, what's called the Domestic and External Security Coordinator in the Prime Minister's Office. He was usually trying to deal with international affairs, mm. but we actually had an affair down here. And we, could we have a, um, a nationally appointed disaster recovery coordinator? Mm -hmm. Which we did in the sense of uh, Peter Kerr, who was recently retired resident engineer of the Ministry of Works. And the, mm. the, the real problem was actually getting a decision on the Grand Earth Flood Wall. Because mm. mm. um, it was with the railways, the borough council, the county mm. council mm. and the Harbour Board were all involved and none of them could agree. And the businessmen mm. didn't know whether they wanted to be the town to shift to High Street or to stay. And mm. So we got Somebody, a disaster recovery coordinator, had the power to actually make decisions. So, mm. knocked a few mm. heads together and it ended up with the flood wall, whether it was the right decision or not. Mm. Mm. Okay, it's, oh God. it's extraordinary, you know, I mean, just getting this, this, this picture really from sort of like inside. And so, so, then along came the regional council in 19. 89. Yes. And it had, uh, well, it was merged basically the United Council and the Catchment Board. Yes. Which was a much bigger organisation. Mm, so mm. it had a um, establishment committee and they appointed a Catchment Board person, not, not mm. locally from Waitaki, to be the chief executive who was rather more mm. scientist scientifically and mm. natural resource oriented than I was, but we still managed to do some things for a few years. Mm. Um, then he was didn't have his contract renewed, so he did, and mine expired at the same time, so he didn't renew mine either. <laughs> so that's when Trisha and I formed our company called Coastlink Services, which we use as a vehicle for doing all sorts of things. Okay. When somebody wants a contract, they would do it that way. If they want us as a staff member, we'll do it that way. Right. So, so his side of it's more the mediation side, and um, mine's been more. And uh, I seem to get involved in quite a lot of transport stuff. Okay, this is a consultancy. He is a consultancy, yeah, in research. And then I was elected as a Grey County Councillor mm. in 1992, mm. Mm. and was appointed. Surprisingly, by Barry Dallas under the Harbour mm. Committee. And I sat there looking at this resource. Mm. As I missed the whole part of the story, it was this during this whole period we're talking about, there was a great move to have a deep sea port on the west coast. That's right. Yeah. Port, port Elizabeth port or Westport or yes, yes. Cape Farrowind or it yeah. immediately started a bit of grey yes, yes. Uh, competition. And there was some of us could see, well that put the railway at threat, and the mm. railway was actually more versatile. Yes. Um, yes. If you're going to have deep sea port to encourage coal and the mm. and things like that, mm. it's going to have to be for very big ships. Mm. Mm. And if you're going to have it for very big ships, they wouldn't cool very often. Right. They're, they're going to have to sit a long way offshore. Mm. Mm. Um, so, it wouldn't work for dairy products. Right. Um, that wouldn't work 
particularly well for sawn timber because the volume is not there. Mm. Sawn timber products. So that went through a yeah. Minister of National Development's uh, working party. And, and then uh, in my interlude between the Regional Council and the next thing it occurred to me that we had missed the thing that was quite obviously sitting in front of us was the ports of Greymouth and the ports of Westport. Mm. They could actually be used as feeder ports to bigger ports, like to New Plymouth or Picton. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and you don't need great big ships, you don't need great big investments, and you can and you can have the ships running more often. Okay. So then I was on the harbour committee at the Mm -hmm. It's a great outfit. Uh, it seemed to have no actually idea of its responsibility for mm -hmm. navigation safety. Okay. And relied more on fishermen mm -hmm. on how it should run it rather than on okay. going out to the wider market. So yep. Fishermen don't want people telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, well, they would, wouldn't be looking at the wider market. So mm -hmm. That's what we tried to do. I mean, did get coal back and gravel shipments. We did have timber shipments to Australia for a while. Yeah, okay. And then Tony um, came the mayor and he had all sorts of proposals to use the site. Well, he had a, had a company set up. To manage a council controlled enterprise which he named Port Westland. So he never oh. likes the name Greymouth, so he really okay, goes Westland. Yes. Um, which had some very good board members, but he sacked them as well. Mm. So I finished with them and just carried on and got myself interested in the heritage projects. Okay. On a, uh, voluntarily or sometimes mm, paid mm, for it. Mm, mm, mm. So that's just what I'm doing now. Mm.